Okay, welcome back everyone. Today we have Dr. Annie Purcell, who's a specialist in physical medicine and rehabilitation. She's she's calling in all the way from California. So Dr. Purcell, welcome to the show. Good morning. Thanks for having me. So we're really excited. We want to have some insight into, you know, why why you became a physical medicine and rehabilitation doctor. Yeah, it's a, it's an interesting field because it has a lot of diversity. And so I'll tell you my path into it and then you'll you'll see how some people come into it for a completely different uh, type of practice. But I had always wanted to do sports medicine in some way and um you know even in high school or undergrad and I didn't even know about this field at all. In a lot of people listening might not have heard about it. It is a smaller field, but um I thought if you want to do sports medicine, you either become an orthopedic surgeon or you can do like primary care and do a sports medicine fellowship. And so I was leaning towards primary care because I, I didn't really want to be a surgeon. And um, as I was in medical school, I, I met other students that were saying they wanted to be a physiatrist and I didn't even know what it was. And then I had one that came and lectured finally in, in my medical school class and it just clicked with me right away that that was the way to go for me because you can become a musculoskeletal specialist and you learn a lot of sports medicine in addition to many other things, but I wouldn't have to do a residency basically for three years learning everything about primary care when I didn't really want to do primary care, you know, the meat of it at all. And then so could you, could you fellowship. define <laughs> for us what physical medicine and rehabilitation is just so – you know, whoever's listening, they get, they get a better understanding of exactly what it means because yeah. I don't think you necessarily get that education when you're in medical school or especially if no. you're pre-med. You usually hear primary care, ophthalmology, orthopedics. You don't really hear physical medicine rehabilitation. Yeah, no, you definitely don't. Um, I think the easiest way to describe it is it's a specialty where you learn the rehabilitation of almost any condition. And so the main ones that, that we focus on is the rehabilitation from strokes, spinal cord injury, brain injury, and then musculoskeletal conditions. So those are the main things, but it can be of anything. And the physical medicine part is about, you know, knowing more about the structure and function of the body and optimizing that as a part of rehabilitation. So it is not drug rehab too. That's the other thing that people think like I'm a rehab specialist. It's not that rehab. <laughs> now you went to an osteopathic school. Rehab. Were yes. you introduced to PM PMNR, which is another is an acronym for physical medicine right. and rehabilitation yes. when you were doing your first two years of clinical medicine or was it in your third so year I where was, you really discovered it? No, it was really great because um, first another student told me about it and I still thought, what the heck is that? I've never heard anything about it. And then, you know, we had a local physiatrist that came and did like a one hour lecture. And that just opened the whole thing up. I, I realized what it was. He was talking about, you know, musculoskeletal topics that I was finally really interested in. And then I went and shadowed in his office right after that. So it was in uh, first and second year. So what was your what were your experiences when you were in medical school? Did you get exposure in your third year or was it really in your fourth year rotation when you had a lot of electives? Yeah, they're, they're only I know we're going back in time, but you know, I think yeah, this no, is important it, sure for, for whoever same, is listening. Yeah, it's, it, you would have to do electives. And so if you're interested, it, it is important to get yourself into that setting before you get to that point, because you're already in the middle of putting them, you know, putting your rank together and trying to get interviews when you might get your first couple rotations. So, um, you know, just doing some shadowing would be enough to, to see if you had that interest and then get the electives later. So what's the best way to be prepared? Um, you mean if you want to apply? Yeah, if you want to apply and you really want to get an idea if, if this is the right field for you. I mean, are there other yeah. options besides physical medicine real bit? rehabilitation that kind of fit the paradigm of the interest that you you had in mind for yourself um for me specifically would only be just doing uh, a regular sports medicine fellowship after a primary care residency 
And so I think if you're very driven towards musculoskeletal and sports medicine, that's a rough way to go if you don't have a lot of interest in like most of your residency before you get to your fellowship. So at least in the track that I took, I did have to learn also other things that I'm not doing, like the inpatient rehab, you know, spinal cord injury, stroke rehabilitation. Um, but I think every specialty, a lot of your rotations aren't exactly what you're going to want to be doing, but you need to know the whole rehab process. So um, I think it's important to get an early exposure so that you understand the field and that you have that before you go to do your elective rotations because, you, you know, I only got two, so I really wanted to go to places that I wanted to match, and you already need to know the specialty and be very enthusiastic at that point. Did you have to do any research in preparation for applying for residency? Um, or would you encourage research? Like published research or research programs? What well, do you mean? Well, research in medical school really geared towards, you know, the, the specialty you ultimately yeah. ended up pursuing. I didn't do that, and I will say that um, the specialty has gotten increasingly competitive, so I'd be surprised if that would fly um, now. But no, I didn't do – I didn't publish in, in the field before I applied or anything like that. Do you think the field <laughs> is getting more competitive because, you know, the baby boomers, every single day I think there's 10,000 of them are turning 65. Is that why the field is becoming so competitive, because there's going to be such a demand I, it doesn't sound like it from the from the young residents that I'm meeting. It's more of an enthusiasm for um, the musculoskeletal and regenerative medicine side or like interventional spine care. So that's another popular fellowship that our graduates do is do an additional year to learn a lot of the, the spine intervention procedures. And, um, you know, neuromodulation is a hot um, area of medicine right now. So a lot of people this is a great path to be able to do one of those fellowships. Basically, those interventional pain fellowships are mostly um, physiatrists or anesthesiologists that are doing them. But our angle is that we learn a lot more about the musculoskeletal workup because of the anesthesia people have to spend a lot of time learning the whole OR side of anesthesia. And then they do the pain fellowship, and they, those guys usually leave that part of it behind and then they have to catch up with the musculoskeletal side. Could you tell us a little bit about what it's like to apply for residency and what those those years look like? While you're applying or the residency well, years? Well, let's talk about applying. What, what's, that yeah, pro so, what's that process look like? Um, you know, I did a really extensive process because um, I was doing a couples match, and so we had to really focus it on – um, big cities with multiple options of programs to match. And so I would say that um, I did way too many interviews just from being paranoid, um, just thinking about, like, I'm really into my finances now and just thinking about all the extra money that I wasted trying to make sure I flew everywhere and interviewed everywhere. Um, I think that was a little bit extreme. I think if you have the I think that's a, that's a typical <laughs> medical student anxiety syndrome. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Just remember that you're broke and you're spending loan money, so you know don't go completely nuts with it. I think if you've been able to interact with certain programs where they know you personally um, and you're going to be ranking those highly, you could lower your paranoia level a little bit and not go to every random place just trying to make sure, you know. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, I know that is common. And then for the residency years, um, we have four years for, for PM&R residency. There's some programs that are linked with their own internship, and there's some that are just um, the second three years. And so that was another hard thing. Um, I actually gambled a little bit with that, where I, I mostly wanted the ones that didn't have an internship. Yeah. But there were a couple really strong programs that were attached. And so you can't, like, rank your internship. You know, you kind of have to decide what you want the most. And so I went for ranking higher the 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 programs without an internship, which left me after the match to scramble to find an open internship. So that was a little risky. But um, Oh, so you did an advanced match at that time? Yeah. It, it might be different now. I don't know what you guys have going on, but I just, you know, it's like where we might have to go to an internship. It's a, like a really random place. But we kind of looked at the spots, and osteopathic is different. Like there were a lot of openings the year before. Yeah, so with we, the merger, it's it's slightly different now. So yes. Okay. 
So that's good because <laughs> that was a little bit sketchy, but it worked out. For okay, us. so you got in. You got into your your one of your top choices. I'm assuming. Mm -hmm. Where did you do mm -hmm. your training? NYU. NYU. Okay, great mm -hmm. place. And yeah. your intern year. Where did you do your intern year? I did it at uh, Plainview Long Island North Shore Hospital. So. It, it was actually an amazing internship because it was a bunch of people just like us. Like, I don't know if there were 15 of us, five people that were going into PM&R and like anesthesia and, you know, people that were just going to specialize. And it really wasn't a rigorous internship. So it was a really, uh, it was a great year for everyone. <laughs> okay. And then you start PM, yeah. PM&R. It's, a, it's mm -hmm. a mouthful sometimes to say. Yes. <laughs> Tell us about what was, you know, is it called PG-1 because it's the first year or is it PG-2, your no, second year? No, they call year? you PGY-2. So we showed up at NYU where PGY-2 is there. And um, the first the first year is the most heavy on call. There's a lot of coverage of the inpatient rehab units. So these are the acute inpatient rehabs are like attached to the hospital. So like there was a floor at Bellevue that we covered. That was the rehab floor. There's, you know, uh, cardiac rehab in NYU in the main medical center. And then there's some outpatient rotations too. But um, we had our own rehab hospital. And so that was the most call that we had. It, it felt like a lot to me. Um, I don't know what it's compared to now. But, you know, a lot of weekends with call and, and weekdays with call. Any night um, calls? It, huh? Any yeah, night they're, over, they're in house overnight. Yeah. So. I mean, these people are still not ready to not be in a hospital setting. So there's medical stuff that you're still helping to manage. Of course. Um, in addition to their rehab. So the call heavy PGY2 year and then, um, which I'm sure not heavy compared to other specialties, though. That's I think that's a part of the um, draw to the field, too, is it, it, it it's a pretty good lifestyle for most of us. Yeah. Um, then third year, less call. Fourth year, barely any call overnight. So, so when and, you and start, they're outreach. really pushing you into it. They're 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 putting a lot of pressure on you right right from the get go because they want they want to get you started. You're, yeah, you're heavily inpatient and learning how that works right away. I would say. <laughs> okay. So, and so people like me that want to do outpatient, the the electives that or the rotations that I enjoy more came you know more in the third and fourth year. <laughs> so what recommendation would you give to someone who's applying for PMNR? Would you say apply to the best program you can get into? Like look for the for the place that has a good mix of outpatient and inpatient? Yeah, and I will say something that I didn't take into account as much when I applied and ranked is if you're doing this specialty for a specific niche, like I was doing it for musculoskeletal and spine, some people do it because they want to be a brain injury specialist. Um, don't, I, I think I based a lot of it, I want to go somewhere that I make sure that I see the best of everything. And that is important. But if there was one place that was the best at your long term niche that you want to put that above everything else, because I think I put some places lower because it was most just mostly outpatient. And I thought, oh, I won't do as well on my boards if I don't see everything. But Really, that would have been ideal to be focused right in, mostly on the expert part of what I want to do. But people change their minds too, so you know it's hard. So you get to, but, you get to the end of residency. What are the options? Do you pursue you a can, fellowship? Do you not pursue a fellowship? What what would you advise? Um, you know, it, there's plenty of work. We we don't have enough physiatrists to support the needs of the country, so. Certainly being able to get a good job right out of training is not hard. Um, but there are a lot of different fellowships you could consider. And um, the most popular ones are like what I did, the interventional spine and sports medicine. But um, there's some very excellent inpatient fellowships. Like if you wanted to do spinal cord injury rehab or traumatic brain injury rehab, those really you do need to do a, uh, a fellowship to, to really um, – be prepared for that. And those are more academic medicine, usually people because they're in the large university centers where they have those programs, but those are very popular as well. Um, so you don't have to do a fellowship, but if you are really into one of those niches, you probably would. So could you run us through what outpatient versus inpatient looks like in terms of a day-to-day -day experience and the exposure you sure. get? Mm -hmm. And I will say a lot of physiatrists do both. So like they might be covering an inpatient rehab unit and have a clinic. 
And those people are usually the inpatient people who, after their patients are discharged home, they'll come see them in clinic, you know, at certain intervals to keep keep going along with their rehab process. So the in the people who do mostly inpatient, you know, I think it, it's like other services. You round on your patients in the mornings, and then you manage things throughout the day. They probably share a call. Um, covering different facilities. Some people also co- cover subacute rehab facilities. Um, that's more remote and not in the hospital. And then outpatient, a lot of people, I would say there's a big portion of our specialty that do like what I do, which is don't cover any inpatient rehab at all and just work in a clinic setting. Like I have my own private practice. So I work, you know, regular business hours. I don't do any call. I don't do any weekends. And um, some days we go do procedures in a facility like a surgery center to do the injections. We do injections in the office with ultrasound guidance and different procedures. Uh, Our practice offers a lot of EMGs. That's a type of testing that only physiatrists and neurologists can perform. And so um, it's just purely outpatient clinic it, it seems like there's a lot of uh, variety in terms of what you're able to do on a weekly basis. You're not mm-hmm. restricted That's to it. a particular procedure. You get to do no. some hands-on stuff. You get to see patients in the in the uh, in the office. It, it seems like there's there's excitement every day. You can have a lot of variety, and I actually um, when when I opened this private practice, it, there were so many different things I could do that I did choose to narrow it down and stop accepting certain types of referrals, and I was able to just hone it right into what I really like to do. And that's um, because I'm in an area that it's, it's really busy. There aren't as many physicians as we need. So a lot of times you'll have the opportunity. You don't have to just take whatever gets thrown your way. You can sort of design your practice the way you want it. Where do you see uh, most of the people finishing their training going afterwards? Are they joining large groups? Are they starting their own practice? Are they staying in the hospital? What's the what's the yeah. pattern in terms of what's most common for people who train as physical medicine and rehabilitation doctors? So in, anyone who's staying um, in inpatient rehab definitely keeps working for a hospital, either through an academic program or, you know, a private hospital. Um, it, it's pretty rare to be self-employed in that setting. Um, it's getting less common to do what I'm doing, which is finish training and open up a private practice. Um, but I still I still see people doing it, and I still really advocate for that because um, it's so important to keep your autonomy. I'm sure you talk to other um, interviewees about physician burnout and you know the moral injury and all the stuff that's happening with everything that's being asked of us. And so if you can find a way to make your private practice work financially, I think you can have a, a lot greater uh, quality of life. So, but then if, if you're not, you know, if you're afraid to do that, which is totally understandable, um, the most common outpatient setting is to like join a physician group with other physiatrists or like join a multi-specialty group, like a common one is with orthopedic surgeons or with neurosurgeons or, uh, or yeah, work for the hospital. <laughs> 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 it seems like you don't you you don't want to have that as an option. That's, that's not my jam, but um, there. But it are might some be someone else's, happy, you know, because some right, people like absolutely. to be in academic environments where they can do research and they don't have to worry about the overhead. They're not worried about being their own uh, entrepreneurial boss, right? Correct. Right. And I will say that in the academic environment, um, to me, those of my colleagues do seem a lot happier um, than non-academic but working for the hospital Because they don't have the overhead. Yeah. And so, yeah, if you don't want to learn about business, you don't want to know with business, you don't want to deal with business, um, you you wouldn't like having your own private practice, and that's definitely something to consider. Dr. Um, Purcell, do you see an equal amount of women and men in the practice? I mean, in terms of, not not patients, but in terms of doctors. Yeah. um, Yeah, I do. I do now. Um, And you know how that changes over time, so that the leadership is starting to reflect that more, but I would say um, the academic and academy leadership is is not 50-50, but I think the residents look 50-50, 
and the enthusiasm for women in the field is is really high right now. So I think that's a positive. So you think it's going to change <laughs> over time in terms of the leadership in the? Yeah, I do because um, I think there's active efforts to to change that, and I see that in a lot of different specialties. So if someone's interested, what would you encourage them to do to increase their chances of becoming um, do, would, doing physical encourage- medicine and rehabilitation? Yeah, I would encourage them to, you know, align with a with a current physiatrist as soon as possible, learn as much about the field from them and, and get the get the in-person exposure to really understand it. You know, a lot of people, it sounds cool in the interview, but it's going to be tough in the interviews if you don't have a true understanding of, of the specialty. So I think that's important to just, you know, get your body in that setting find someone who can mentor you and so that you really know it well and you can show your enthusiasm. And what are you most excited about in terms of the field, where, where the field is going? Uh, I think I'm most excited because there are some new advances. Um, I would say with regenerative medicine, um, we've really taken a big interest in that as a specialty and it's early, but it's a, it's a promising um, thing that we'll be able to offer our patients. And, um, that's more on the musculoskeletal side, but that's what I see more of. And there, there are new procedures coming and there are new things that we might be able to offer that no one even mentioned when I was a resident 10 years ago. So I love that. Okay. Well, Dr. Purcell, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy, your busy Sunday morning. And I think this is going to be very informative for, for medical students and pre-med students who are really interested in this particular field. So thank yeah, you so much. Yeah, I wish we had all this social media when I was trying to look into it. So it's a great thing that you're doing. <laughs> okay, thank you so much. Okay, thank you.